West Village is a prime location. The house underwent a series of renovations yet to be completed. Is this a marble fireplace? You'd be surprised what you could do with a little cosmetic fix-up. Just the kind of things you could do yourself. You two could be millionaires by the end of the year. I think it's exciting. I've always wanted to live in a haunted house. An added bonus to an already perfect living situation. You need an analyst. Why is it so hard for everyone to accept? Have an open mind, Marla. David? Did you hear that? Do you know anything about the people that lived here before? But remember that spirits can't hurt you. Are you sure about that? I mean, you know, life is a joke, it really is. a very comfortable feeling to know that such weird things are taking place. But certainly you don't believe those newspaper stories about werewolves. That's just sensational trash, the sort of thing one reads in Penny Dreadful. If one reads Penny Dreadful. You don't read them, do you? Oh, of course not. Jessica has seen a man with a gun. What makes it difficult is that we have to match the footage that we shot now uh, about nine months ago. Get the fuck out of the house! Um, Are you shooting that whole thing from there? Just don't show it to me. That's good. This movie, Penny Dreadful, uh, kind of came out of left field. Brian Norton, who's been teaching at the uh, film school, and uh, we met, I think, before the movie was even in his mind. Maybe yes, maybe no. But he said, one day, maybe we can work together. And he called to say, yes, I'm making this film. And uh, would you be in it? I do love my stories. <laughs> and it's a very interesting movie. I think it's great. 
I just think it's wonderful. Then I began to think about it because the way I work on a role and develop a character, you go back and you give them a life ahead of time. So my life ahead of time, which of course I didn't tell Brian what it was, was that this woman, you know, has had psychic tendencies all of her life, but um, when she really grows up, she doesn't really turn out to be the most. I hope she's a little on the cuckoo side. This is Mrs. Treadwell. She came by to check out the house. Just call me Judy. Trudy, I mean. This is a pretty house. Going to say yay or nay about believing in ghosts because I don't know everything that goes on in this wonderful world. From the moment we're conceived, we're on our way to making the transition. And I look at it this way it's being a senior for the last time in your life, and this is the big graduation. And I'm ready for it whenever. That is a final wrap for Best of Father. Delighted to be back. Brian, darling, you are without a doubt the best. And I love having to do things more than once with you. It's interesting because you brought the magazine today, the Cosmopolitan magazine. I think I'm on the cover of the magazine of oh, those days of what, but uh, that it, I end up at the end saying that, oh, I wish somebody would let me do a horror film. I must say that now 20, it's in its 27th year and a cult film, <laughs> and I'm considered the queen of the slashers. I mean, you know, life is a joke. It really is. The whole thing is so crazy. I, I, I read the script of uh, Friday the 13th. I said, well, this will never make it. This is a piece of, you know, junk, <laughs> dreck, shit. I said shit, really. But that makes the flowers grow, you see? Yes. Things that you think are manure make the flowers grow. So, you know, I think the thing that was so great about it about that particular one, as I say, I've not seen any of the other ones, and I will not acknowledge Jason in the hockey mask. I don't know who that is. I say, you know, I'm crazy, but I'm not insane. My little boy, if he weren't at the bottom of Crystal Lake, I never would have done the things I did. That movie, in particular, allows you to use your imagination. It doesn't come on strong and show you all the blatant, horrific, 
instances that happen in most of these kind of films, you know. It's a simple film, wonderful, wonderful boys and girls who played these kids setting up the, the camp, you know, on the lake. Everybody's clean cut, everybody's, you know, just so sweet and lovable in the camp. It was a boy, is a Boy Scout camp, Camp Nobby Bosque over in North Bergen County. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, the whole thing, and even when I come in, uh, like the troops to save the day, this nice lady, you know, and then whammo. Yeah, yeah, they asked me two times, maybe three times. But the, there were no lines, you know, I mean, there were a couple of lines, you promised me you'd go and kill somebody, I don't know. There, there, was, there was not a role really developed that it would just be bringing me back in to show Mrs. Voorhees and maybe entice people who like to see Mrs. Voorhees again, I suppose. And there was never really any great money. Everybody thinks that I've made all these residuals. No, I made my $10,000. I worked 10 days, $1,000 a day, and I bought that little Scirocco Volkswagen for $9,999.50 or whatever. And that was it. I don't see how they can possibly do it. I really don't. I hear the rumor. Um, someone at, at one point in time said that, um, what's his name, that uh, Frank Tarantino, no, not Frank, uh, Quentin, Tarantino. Quentin, Quentin Tarantino was going to be directing one of them. And I said, OK, I'll work for him. I will, because I, I, I think he could bring something interesting to it. But uh, then that, that all passed away. But I have also heard the rumor, why remake it? Why? What is that? And I don't, first of all, the first one is, was uh, so spontaneous. And, and Sean Cunningham did a great job on it. Even the, the music and the <laughs> all of this stuff, you know, was great, really great. And so they know the film. Why would they want to go and see a remake? No, I, I think it would be disloyal to the fans for me to do a cameo. And I thought it was rather outrageous. I didn't see it, but when they were doing it with uh, Freddie from Elm Street, uh, they tried to get another woman that so supposedly looked like me and sounded like me. And of course, all the adorable fans say, we knew it wasn't you. It doesn't look like you or sound like you. I have nothing against the actress who's doing it. And I guess, um, I don't know, there was just going to be that one scene at the cemetery or something. You promised me you'd go last night. You know. <laughs> Oh, yes, there is one. There is one. Yes. It's a... And she's such a good actress, this girl. Woman. She is now. Um, it was a, a stranger is calling. And a stranger called. Carol Kane is such a brilliant actress anyway. And she was so wonderful in that. And that, I'll tell you, when she opened the door as a young babysitter, and there's Charles Durney. <laughs> I jumped, I jumped in my seat. And then when she rolls over in bed and she thinks it's her husband, oh! Penny Dreadful, I mean, there's, there's a whole scene. See, when I kept trying to read the script and I kept saying, this thing is not making any sense to me. I, I can't figure this movie out. And you really give everybody a, a whammy at the end that you say, Oh my gosh, well, the whole idea, the twist at the end. You know, you we're so used to just following a pattern. You broke the pattern. Oh, fabulous. And the young lady, Emily, she especially, she's so wonderful. Do you feel something? Shh. This house. But the thing about the film is, everybody is so perfect, and every moment, like, you know, that man who ends up being the bad man, and being a, a, also a Jason, and, and, and just even the glimpse of the mother and the child, 
all of it is so perfect. It's all a whole. It's not a piece here and a piece there and a chop chop and all of that. It's one beautiful presentation of a work of love. Yeah, I'm honored. Like I said that I was honored to meet you. Oh no, no, I'm very delighted to be a part of a great work of art. And one, you know, sort of likes to be thought of in that direction. It's, it's lovely to be loved that way. It really is. It's very, very interesting. Because sometimes in deeply personal, and I find this to be really true when I go to the conventions, you know, people come, now it's like two generations, now they're babies, a third generation, that they'll put in my arms and yeah. <laughs> have a picture. And I have a sweater that looks like Mrs. Worry's sweater, sweater that I wear. And uh, it's, um, they, and they're so happy to find me as jovial and as uh, uh, vul not well vulnerable in a way. Yes, I'm not what you call untouchable. I don't stay behind the table where my pictures are. I go out and mm -hmm. we hug and we have a nice, you know, picture taken, candid shop take, and then all of that. I enjoy that. I really do. I like it. it. Takes a lot of energy because I really zero in at the moment. I zero in. Don't ask me to remember you at the next convention. Right. People do, you know, they say, don't you remember me three years ago and I came and got your picture? I have to say no. At the moment, I'm very, very deeply focused. But once they're gone, well, no, for a few days I can see them around the convention hall and say hi mm -hmm. and recognize that they've been at my table. But other than that, hmm, it slips away. To have an audience and to be loved all my life as I have been and and appreciated and not appreciated I think sometimes too you know when I've really given them a lot of heart but to have people just enjoy to enjoy what the work of art is to enjoy being entertained to uh, uh, dig this lady or dig me I'm not <laughs> sure what it is it's I'll tell you, it's very, very hard to encompass that a thousand people saw this film and that their response was the way it was. It, it was like, you know, when people would say, do you realize when you do these shows on television that millions of people are seeing you? Well, I never think of it that way. I always think of it as just being one person that's watching it all. I never think of it in, in large uh, quantities of numbers. And so each one is a personal um, feeling of uh, a nice stroke that somebody is giving me.